I want to welcome you to a new three-part series that we're going to spend some time together talking about the subject of vision. And you may be surprised that maybe you think that that topic is exclusively owned by other parts of culture or society, but you may be surprised to find in this series that we serve a God of vision who communicates to his people through vision, and we have that uh, we know that to be true because we see that in Scripture. I want to welcome those watching online, maybe watching this message later, also those at 1230 who make room and make space for others. Would you put your hands together and welcome those that are joining us as well. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts in the New Testament, Acts chapter 9. We're going to look and start in verse 3, and I'm going to tell you a story, and we're going to read it from Scripture of one of the key places where we see this subject of vision played out. In fact, it is one of those places that is referred to by even people outside of Christianity where they might describe, I had a Damascus Road experience, and some of you know what that means, others of you may not, but more than just the story, we're gonna draw from it some components of that that can bring clarity to our vision individually as well as collectively and together. Sometimes we'll talk about marriage and family and subjects that the Bible emphasizes, always all of it centering around Jesus and that's where our real hope is found. But a few years ago I recognized it's, it's just, it's kind of practical and that is that as you have a group of people who desire not to just be a mob of people, not just a crowd of people, not just a group of people who come in and listen to some person talk on a platform with a microphone or sing songs and sort of come in and out for the service, if you will, but if you desire to be what you may have felt when you came here, and I know some of you are new, when you feel this sense of unity, when you feel, feel this sense of warmth and family, again, there's something that, that we are intentionally moving toward. And that is that from the very beginning, we desired to be a spiritual family. Well, just like in your natural family, as your family grows, communication becomes challenging. When we had our first child, Hannah, you know, that was an accessory. We just kind of took her wherever, just kind of like, you know, like we just, just brought her along. Then we had two, three, four. Let me just tell you, communication becomes more challenging when you got four, and now we got to kind of, man, now we got them leaving the house, and everybody's mobile, and, you know, they get cars and stuff. Come on now, you know what I'm talking about. If you want to have some sense of unity in your family, you have to be more deliberate about your communication. Some of you go, well, I don't have a family. Well, friends, if you're going to go out for the night with your friends, if you're just taking one friend, well, that's simple. But if 10 people are going on the trip, then it requires more text messages. And then you got to get sign-up genius and all that going on. You know what I'm talking about. Because you're trying to keep everybody together headed in the same direction. So a few years ago, I started these vision weekends. And because our family is growing, I really felt like at this season of time in the life of Milestone, and I'm doing this for two reasons. I'm doing it for all of you that are part of Milestone. It's important to continue to make sure that vision is clear because vision leaks. And the second reason I'm doing it is there's so many of you that are new or kind of hanging around. You're like, what do these people care about? What do they focus on? What do they make a big deal about? And I believe that it'll, it'll practically meet us on a personal level and our personal vision, but it's also gonna help us together. You say, what is vision? I'm, I'm naturally a visionary person. I'm always asking and was as a kid, why are we doing this? What are we doing it for? What are we trying to do? Well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not real good at let's just aimlessly do a bunch of stuff that doesn't end, end up at the right place. And so I'm naturally a visionary person. I've learned some things over the years about vision. I've had a lot of help. I've had a lot of mentors. And so in this series, uh, even practically, I hope this is something you can take into your everyday world. Vision is a mental picture of a preferable future. It's the ability, hopefully you will submit that to God to see through the eyes of God 
what he sees out in the future and that mental picture helps you pass the obstacles, it, it gives you discipline, it gives you constraint, it prioritizes your life, it not only helps you to say yes to certain things, it also helps you to say no to certain things because you have a mental picture of a preferable future. Some of you go, I, I don't know how that works, especially spiritually. Well, let me go back to if you have children. When you have children, sometimes, again, you, you have vision for them, or maybe you have vision for a friend that they can't see. See, that's, that's when we start thinking about God, God loves us so much more than we can love others in the natural, and he has vision for our lives. He has plans, he has purposes, he has design that he works with within our own lives to bring us to where he's called us to go. And so in this series, we're gonna talk about what God has to say about vision. Let's go to this moment here in Acts chapter nine. Again, God is an intelligent designer. He, he lives above it all, and so he sees it all. He created it all. He spoke it all into existence. And I know when I read through the Bible, if you've never done like an annual reading plan and read through some of those books that you never get to on a regular basis, one of the things I'm always amazed by is that there is intricate detail in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. It's like, man, God doesn't forget anything. So he's an intelligent, on purpose, intentional God who creates with intentionality, and we see stories all the way through the Old Testament of him giving vision to prophets and priests and kings and speaking about his desire, and all of those are types and shadows that lead us to the person of Jesus Christ, which is his ultimate plan and purpose was to bring Jesus to us. You say, what is one of the primary visions God has for our lives? Is that we were separated from him because of sin. And his primary desire for us is to have fellowship with us, to have relationship with us. And Jesus said of himself, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. So life here on earth and life eternally comes from the intentional plan of God to send his own son. That he would die on the cross for us. You say, what's this whole thing about? It's not about you getting your own willpower or you joining a religion. Every other religion says join our vision. Jesus said, you didn't have a vision, you didn't have life, you were dead in trespasses and sins, so I'm coming to you. And I'm gonna die on the cross for you and pay the price that you could never pay. And then he raises from the dead and he says again, he's better for him to go into heaven because he would send us the Holy Spirit who would help us. And so the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost. I'm preaching the everlasting Bible today. Come on now, stay with me. You're like, I thought we were talking about Acts chapter nine. No, we're talking about the whole Bible. Holy Spirit's poured out. It's important for you to know this because so many people today are like, where do I get vision? You can get it right here. This is what God's all about. He pours out his spirit. He births the church. The church is exploding. Every day people are being saved. They're being sincere with one another. They're walking in fellowship with one another. They're praying with one another. There was a single day where thousands were added. There's kind of this narrative today, man, you know, if the church is growing, people are coming, man, what's wrong? Is there something wrong? Well, look, if you have trouble with people coming to Christ and people being added, you'd have had problems with the early church. Because this thing, man, and they had problems. Come on now. They're trying to solve them. Early days, all these people coming, and they have in Acts 6, and they've got to solve this, and you take care of that, and they've got to divide and conquer. And then we see a moment where one of the early church leaders is martyred meaning he's killed for his confession of Jesus, and the guy in this story is there, and he's one of the ones that led the charge to persecute and kill Christians. No one is beyond God's reach. No one is beyond God's vision. In Acts chapter nine, we see here that he's on this road, verse three, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord Saul asked. He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He replied, now look as he starts. There's the revelation of Jesus, and when that revelation comes, then there's vision and directive that comes from Jesus. So he has this revelatory moment, an encounter with Jesus. Now he starts ordering Paul's life as he becomes Paul. Right here he saw, now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do, okay? Then we see another component to vision, we'll talk about it in a minute, is in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. 
The Lord called to him in a vision and said, Ananias, look at him, he's speaking not only to Paul in a revelation way, but he's also speaking to Ananias in a vision. Said the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on a straight street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying, and it says, in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Notice here how he brings two people together, but they're still the same vision. By the way, vision has a way of uniting people in a way nothing else can. If you say, I'd like to have greater intimacy with people or have greater relationships, you will have the greatest relationships with the people you share vision with. It's like in a home, when a family has a shared vision, there's greater unity. In a church where there's shared vision, there's greater unity. In a company where there's greater vision and shared vision, there's greater unity. Where there's clarity of vision, there's a dynamic of those people coming together. Notice here, there's, there's this people dynamic. Why does God do it this way? I don't know, but this is a pattern. This is a pattern. Look down here at verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul. Now, this is the guy that has the reputation of killing everybody. Come on now. He said to him, Brother Saul, that's probably by faith, you know. (laughs) Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, he has sent me so that you may see again. There's a physical dimension, but there's this other intangible spiritual dimension. It says you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales, they're saying light scales because they don't really describe or don't know exactly what it is, but it fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. And then I'd like to jump over to show you the ultimate influence of vision is not just for your own personal well-being. When vision is tied to God, it's always gonna influence the lives of other people as well. So we see the two characters in the story become lots of people because it says in verse 31, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. So there was a whole host of people that were strengthened by this visionary moment that took place. Some of you are like, that's out of the box, and it is, okay? You've got a guy, road to Damascus, encounter with Jesus, lights, You know, scales falling from people's eyes, two visions being spoke. You're like, that seems like a million miles away. Well, let me try to take this story, as I said again, and let's try to let's try to look at some of the relatable components and some of the relatable principles that we see throughout the word so that we can think and evaluate about our own vision. Well, the first thing that you see from this story that I think that we need to kind of encapsulate it with, fulfillment in life happens when your vision aligns with what Jesus values, okay? So so ultimately, this fulfillment, this this contentment, Paul would go through persecutions. He would go through suffering, but in a minute, I'm gonna show you the end of the story, and he has this conviction and this confidence and this fulfillment that we see even in the New Testament letters that comes from this moment, when his world began to be aligned with Jesus' intentions and desires. And that's what happens with vision in our lives. Now some of you go, look, I'm not in that place. I'm starting a little bit further back from that. And I understand, because I've been all of these that I'm about to share with you. Here's where we are concerning vision. Some of you are straining for vision. You're, you're kind of straining for it, right? It's like. I, 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 I wanna see it, what, maybe you've seen it before, maybe you've not seen it. It's like what happened to me in December. Um, I had this moment when I was about 16 years old. I recognized that I couldn't see the chalkboard, I couldn't see street signs. I uh, went to my parents, they took me to the eye doctor and I got contact lenses. So I've been wearing contact lenses since I was 16 years old. I do well with them, it's great, I put them in, I see perfect, if I take them out, I'm blind, I'm in trouble when it comes to far off. But in December, I do a fair amount of reading. I picked up something to read and I, anybody know what I'm talking? Anybody feel my pain? Anybody moving toward 50? Come on now, anybody? Anybody in that phase of life, come on. And I was like, hello Houston, we have a problem. (laughs) And I strained a little bit, I'm like, man, there's something wrong. And then I just kinda kinda moved it out a little bit like that. (laughs) Wow, it looks great, come on now. I told my wife about it, she said, well you're just gonna have to borrow my readers. 
I said, well, honey, you know, you, you rock the readers. You know what I'm saying? You know how to, you look hot in the readers. But the man of God is going to believe by faith to get healed, okay? Because I'm not wearing them things. You may have to get a gold chain on them or something, you know? I mean, come on now, you know? And some of y'all got like 20 pairs of them laying all over the house. Come on now. I'm resisting the devil. Come on, and he will flee. Some of you are straining when it comes to vision. You're like, I don't see it. Haven't been able to make sense of it. Others of you are just stumbling around when it comes to vision. I work with people, I, I love people, I pastor people. I'm amazed at the number of people who allow all kinds of ideas and different things that may not even lead to the right things that if you don't really have a vision for your life, if you don't have God's vision for your life, there's plenty of people that have an idea for what you can do. And they just stumble around, just kind of just living life, just trying to make it, just trying to see if this will work, trying that, stumbling around toward vision. There's others, other people, in, and I've been here, disappointed with vision. You're a little disappointed. You had a vision for marriage, but there, there was problems there, and maybe there wasn't enough clarity on the front end. Maybe there wasn't enough clarity in the middle of it, and it ended up in a challenging place. Maybe you're disappointed with the vision for a business where everyone didn't get on the same page, and maybe everyone didn't have the same vision, and maybe there wasn't momentum, and that left you in a place where you get disappointed. Maybe you've been disappointed when it comes to a church talking about vision because you've been disappointed or hurt in that setting. And I have a teaching that I do with leaders and I'll do it in staff meetings in churches around the country where I talk about there's, a, there's, there's something really challenging when you get vision scarring because you can get calluses around your heart that scar you. And if you don't let Jesus heal that, you can become resistant to his plan for you. But we've all been disappointed with vision. Some of you are dissatisfied by vision. I met a guy the other day who had a very successful career in an oil company. His wife says, I don't know why, he just, he just seems dissatisfied. He's probably mildly discouraged and depressed. He had had a great career and then had done really well and he's still a fairly young guy and then for the last several years he's just kind of just floated around and, and he doesn't have a lot of purpose and he doesn't know where to go and she's like, he's not the same. Well, well here's, here's the challenge of what I would say to that is you had a portion of God's vision for your life but you didn't have the complete target. Some of the most dissatisfied people on the planet are those who set a target that they think will bring them to ultimate fulfillment only to obtain it. And then realize that is at a loss to truly fulfill me. And so I see this happen a lot in a lot of people's lives. We're dissatisfied in our culture today because we've actually chased it down, we've caught it, we've apprehended it, and then we're like, really, is this all there is? I wanna tell you, when you read the word of God, his vision pulls you up. It's not to say that it can't include some of those things, but it pulls you up above it all in such a way that you're able to continue to pursue what he has for your life. See, there's a theological term about God. He's transcendent, which means he's above it all, so he has the ability to help us make sense of it all. I think about the vision here at Milestone. I, uh, I took my daughter the other day by a little cafetorium, a little school over here in South Keller, my youngest. I said, see that school, it's special. <laughs> she said, Dad, it looks just like a school. I said, well, we used to do church there. And there was a vision at that moment that we had. There's a vision that we still have. And that vision in the days where it was challenging is the vision that kept us prioritizing that vision. And it's the same discipline in those days. And by the way, it wasn't easy. Wasn't easy all the time, the same discipline in those days that now brings us to the place of where we are today, whereas all of you are coming in, we're saying, hey, we're still, we're still on the same vision. We're not planning to change just because there's more of us. And so we're prioritizing that same vision. And again, it, there were days, that not, now we got all these excitement and people and things happening. We used to, in fact, we're having 101 today. Love for you to come. We'll have it right after the 11 o'clock service and you, you could come, I'd love to meet you. But I remember when no one came to 101, no one came, right? And, 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 and you know, we were, I was appealing, you know, just like I am, come, won't you come? You know, like Billy, Billy Graham, won't you come? Thousands are coming to Christ, to Jesus, come to 101. No one came. So we had to have a thing called newcomers 
just to kind of soften the water a little bit, just to kind of like warm it up. You're like, what was that? Well, we'd get a home, we'd get some desserts, we'd get people in there, and we'd try to relate to people a little bit so they wouldn't think we're a weirdo, so they might come join our vision, right? So, so, so we, we'd get in there, you know, and have desserts. And I remember specifically right here in Keller, we had a house, nice house, we had some desserts, had it. One guy came, <laughs> one person. And so we'd sit around, hey, how are you? How'd you find Milestone? There's, it's kind of awkward, you know what I'm saying? You're trying not to make eye contact with the one, you know. We're all here today. We're, well, you're here. We're here, but here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors. There's no people. You're here, though. Um, and so uh, you kind of go around and, you know, hey, man. And, uh, so, so what do you think? You know, sir, I, what do you He said, well, I, I, I've been to your church twice. I don't even like it. Praise God. He said, someone just told me about this. I heard y'all had food. You know, he's a younger guy. I said, I heard you had food. I said, praise God, we're gonna need your credit card number so you can pay for the food. But uh, no, I, I remember those days. But see, we, we, made, uh, we, we, we had a desire that we received from Jesus to, to, to touch the one or to touch the two or the five. It wasn't really contingent upon how many. It's a vision that transcends the numbers of people in the room. It's a vision that aligns with what Jesus is heart is, you say, how do I make sense of that in my practical life? Well, I wanna give you three components that produce a clear vision. Number one, the how. If you're gonna get clear vision, you have to go, okay, how do I get vision? As I said earlier, God is transcendent, so he's above it all, so he helps you make sense of it all. So the how comes from God. In the secular culture, we don't have any shortage of ideas or goals or vision boards or strategies or leadership books, and, but many times we have the wrong starting place. The starting place is how can you find your vision? Can I encourage you? Even if you're not a believer in Jesus, I'm gonna tell you, Jesus is a great starting place to get a vision for your life. And if you are a follower of Jesus, that's our starting point. We don't start with, how can I uniquely find out my personal expression of every single thing that I want to personally express to find my unique vision for my life? I start with, Jesus, what do you care about? What do you prioritize? What's on your heart? What do you value? And so we start there in that place, and here's what happens. Because he's above it all, he can make sense of it all. Here's what begins to happen in your life. You're like, Jeff, what does this mean? Like if I value what Jesus values to the most, does that mean I have to go in the ministry? Do I have to become a pastor? Do I have to become a priest? Do I have to become a monk? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I will tell you this, if you're in business, when you tie your vision to what Jesus values, it affects how you go to the boardroom. Because what happens is you steward your people because you steward them well because Jesus cares about people and people matter to God. So your employees begin to see a character and a nature and a demeanor that represents Christ. I'm amazed by the number of people who who you begin to talk to and they're like, well, I don't wanna be a Christian. I don't know anybody, any Christians that are filled with joy. They relate in the boardroom with the same problems, the same unhealth that everybody else does. So you manage your employees different. All those resources that you're making, And you you begin to see, okay, there's a tie to, because God gives seed to the sower, there's a tie to all of this marketplace world to the funding and releasing of what God wants to do in the kingdom. So now what happens is what you do every day gets tied to Jesus' heart. If you're in a season where you're taking care of little children, not valued near enough today. Not valued near enough today. Go do something big. Kids are a liability. No, 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 no. If you're having to come home to sippy cups and crackers and problems and diapers and training pants, let me just tell you, you better have a high vision for that. You say, how do I have vision for that? Because Jesus said, go and make disciples. And you realize I'm not just taking care of sippy cups, I'm making disciples that can change the world. So you start tying them together, see? You start tying those things together. How you live every single day, you start tying them together, you begin to make sense of it. And you know what else happens? You stop having to compare. I see this in our, you stop comparing and competing so much when you have Jesus' vision. I'll say this to young people today. When I was a younger person, I didn't really know what everybody else was doing. 
I was just going to wake up every day, love people, make disciples, build his church. I know, again, that pertains to me as a pastor, but I didn't know what everybody else was doing, so I didn't spend a lot of my energy trying to compare what I did to what everybody else does, and it also kills in you a competing against other people, and you don't compare and compete when you're living to say, to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. It changes when you get the vision from Jesus. The second is the who, though. The who, it helps you have clarification and calibration to your vision. It's clarified and calibrating. So there's instruments, maybe medical devices or medical instruments, or maybe a scale that's very important. So a scale for it to continue to give the right weight, sometimes it has to be calibrated. You're like, okay, how is vision? Is it clarified and calibrated? Well, look what happened in Paul's life. Ananias was part of the process. And so as I said earlier, if you want intimacy, intimacy is a byproduct of shared vision. So, so just make sure you wanna go where the people you're hanging around are going. Just make sure you wanna hit the target, the people you're hanging around, the target they're hitting. So, so whatever your target is, you wanna surround yourself with people that speak into that, that calibrate that, that focus on that. And that helps bring clarity to your vision. It's very, very important. I sat with a group of new people in Milestone here that some, some just new people and our pastoral team put them together and said, Pastor, I want you to meet them. I had a meal. I love to just meet people and hear from people and talk. And I just, I'm a pastor who loves people. And we had a great meal and I, I just listened to them. I took a yellow pad, literally two and a half hours of listening to them, ways we can be better as a church, serve people, not change our vision because it's not, it's not up for a vote. Not new ideas and new programs. How can we be better at the vision God has given us? And so I'm listening to them, and one of the I, so I listen for, for words and themes that come out, and the two words and themes I kept hearing was intentionality and spiritual family. Intentionality and spiritual family. See, when you get a vision from Jesus and it's clarified and calibrated by those people that come together and they begin to move toward that vision, then you have intentionality because it's not a vision, it's a hallucination if it's not executable. I mean, a lot of people today, they call themselves visionaries. No one's following, no one knows where you're going and it doesn't fit Jesus' agenda. That's a hallucination. That's not a vision. Okay, a vision that comes from God aligns with Jesus' values, it brings the who together, and it moves toward what Jesus says is important along the way. And here's what else it does that gives you great momentum is it helps you answer the why. The why, it closes the gap between what you value and how you really live. I'm a why-asking person. Why do we go to church? I asked my parents that when I was young. Why are we doing this? Why are we here? Because if we're just gonna sing kumbaya and eat potluck, I'm out. I wanna know what Jesus wants us to actually be focusing on. Why are we doing this? Why do we put so much resource into it? Why are we putting energy into this? What is this all about? Why are we trying to do this? Because when you know why, it closes the gap from theories to how you really live. And that happened with Paul. He suffered great persecution, had great trouble, and I remember as a young 21-year-old pastor reading this verse, and you think I'm saying this to be for effect or preacher effect or exaggeration, I'm being dead serious. I remember where I was when it happened. I remember my bones like feeling like they were on fire. I don't know if you've ever read the Bible and it had that kind of impartation to you. It's life-changing when it happens. And I read this part in Acts 26 where Paul goes back and revisits this vision that he got from, from Jesus in a real encounter with Jesus. And I read those words in there where Paul is standing before Agrippa, okay? He's standing before this, this council. He's standing before these people and he's having to give, a, give, give a, a testimony as to why he's doing what he's doing. And King Agrippa's like, I wanna let you speak for yourself. And he started telling King Agrippa, I, I received this vision. I, I received a vision to turn those from darkness to light to those that were under the, the, under the dominion of Satan to God. And, and he says this, he says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, this vision that came from heaven. And so Paul says, that's what I was doing. You know what is so powerful, by the way? Man, if we would become consumed with a heavenly vision, what Jesus has on his heart, King Agrippa said, 
you're so convinced of this, you're about to convince me to be a Christian. I love that little phrase there. He's like, man, because why? You, he, he understood, Paul understood the why that he was prioritizing what he was prioritizing. Over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna unpack practically what we believe is what Jesus values. We're gonna talk about some of the who's, and we're gonna talk about why. We're gonna talk about why, why I have a heart, our team has a heart, people here have a heart, for you to be able to, again, we're not the Apostle Paul. As I said, we're not asking everybody to go into full-time ministry or some sort, but, but begin to go, okay, how do I practically really engage with that? And that's why we have a simple vision called Reaching People, Building Lives here at Milestone Church that affects our how, it affects our who, it affects our why. Don't get caught up in the mantra of it. You're like, where does that come from? It's not like Nike, just do it. It comes from what Jesus said he values in every single gospel. In every single gospel, we see this and the book of Acts, it comes back to, I want you to go therefore and make disciples. I want you to reach people. It, it ties in with the great commandment to love God with all your heart and to love others as well. And so we see this prioritization and calibration that comes from the heart of Jesus himself. And so we just put it in a simple phrase of reaching people, building lives. Some of you go, can you break that down for me? Yeah, let me show it to you real quick. First of all, we believe according to scripture that man is not basically good. We are created in the image of God, but the Bible teaches us that we are dead in trespasses and sins. So therefore, without Jesus, we are lost. And so you start with a person who's lost and I, and I say this a lot, and I have to remind us in our culture today, heaven is a real place, hell is a real place, and eternity is a long time. And so people without Jesus, they're lost eternally, but that doesn't mean that everybody that, that, that we're talking to is necessarily eternally lost or doesn't know Jesus, but there's a lot of people lost relationally. They don't have the who's in their life. They don't have the people they journey with that's praying for them before they go to that business meeting, that's praying with them and building with them. They don't have those relationships. And so there's a lot of people lost. There's a lot of people in our community here who are in transition and they feel a little lost because they've been displaced from their social networks and family relationships. So lost people, according to what I read in scripture, we don't just pray and hope they become unlost. He uses us as fishers of men. He uses us who go after the prodigal. He uses us who go out and reach out to the lost person. And then when that person who is lost becomes found, we help them take spiritual next steps. We get really excited about that here at Milestone. We get really excited about helping you take next steps. We wanna help you through our grow track. Why do we have a grow track? To help you start learning what it means to walk with Jesus. Help you learn how to read your Bible. Help you learn how to use your gifts and discover your gifts. Help you find some friends that you can journey with. Help you build spiritual foundations in your life small groups and relationships, and then on our serve team to be able to use your gifts, to give back, to serve, to serve others. And then what happens is as you take those steps, you become part of spiritual family. Those of you that have been around here at Milestone and you've walked through that process, you would say, man, I found some of my greatest friends. I've found some growth. I've found some areas of my life. I've, I've seen that. And, and, and I wanna tell you, we want this for every single one of you. We get excited about it. But then there's some of you go, well, I've kind of done some of those things. Guess what? There's more. There's more. And I'm going to tell you about another level of excitement of aligning your vision with Jesus's vision. It's when you not only go through that process and begin to live out some of those things of being saved, being water baptized, being filled with the Holy Spirit, being discipled, being added to the church, all that Bible stuff, you know what I'm saying? But when you then see yourself as an instrument in the hand of God to help that lost person take their next spiritual step, man, that gets powerful now. I'm warning you, proceed at your own risk. You're like, I just kind of feel like I've just been floating. Because there's a version of Christianity that today says, just continue to sit in series and message after message of five ways to be more successful, six ways to figure out when Jesus will return, seven ways to get more information, and we just get filled and filled and filled with more information, but we have no application. The way you grow is, is when you begin to apply. You go, I don't have a lot of the word. 
give away what you have and you'll get more. You start giving it away to someone else and so you help other people take their next steps and then you help them come into spiritual family. I'm gonna close this message by being even more practical for just a minute. Here's what we get excited. I wanna give you the behind the scenes. You're talking about on staff. What do we get excited about? Well, we'll have services, we'll have women's events, we'll have Christmas Eve where we have overflows and all that coming up here at Christmas. We're gonna have space issues and overflows. And here's, we get excited about all the people that come to know Jesus at that. But I wanna tell you, I'm not most excited about the hundreds of people I preach to this weekend. I'm most excited about the people I know. I have a friend, I think is in this service, who's coming. He and I, he, he gave his life to Christ. He's coming to 101 to take spiritual steps. I like to say it this way. It's always good when you're a preacher to actually be a Christian. I still get excited about the basic Christian stuff that we get to do. We get to do. And you know what we get excited about since we moved in this building? Yeah, we started in that cafetorium I told you about. And here's the power of Milestone. If you walk in here and you feel something, there were a group of people there that helped those people take spiritual steps. And then we just keep journeying along in a rented building and then a grocery store behind Taco Casa. That's the house of the taco. And then <laughs> all those people just keep helping people take spiritual steps. Then we move in this big building and we're not enamored by the big building. You go, it doesn't feel like a big church. It doesn't feel it's about the light show. It doesn't feel like it's the pastor's pocket square. Praise God, it's got power. <laughs> it's not about all that. It's about people helping people take steps. And what we get excited about is since we moved in this building, not the thousands of people that have come to services, but 2,800 people who have engaged that growth track and started taking spiritual steps to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what we get excited about. We get excited about this weekend, I came here before services and there was all these people who were taking steps toward freedom. Now it's not an event based, come on, that's a great place to clap, I see freedom shirts in the room. That's not an event based deal where there's just the man of God talking to people about freedom and then it's a one and done and we make the whole goal just the event of freedom because we're making disciples who need to be delivered from things. The goal is not just getting to freedom and man, wow, we're here, now we're free, what do we do? The goal is that if you're gonna make disciples, they gotta unload the baggage to be able to fulfill the purpose and the vision that Jesus has for their life. So along the journey, people have to receive freedom. And there were 382 people who went through these several weeks small groups and small group leaders, people leading others along the way, then come to this moment where they receive healing and they receive ministry and they let go of baggage, and they get free and they get filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a powerful thing. You're like, man, that's exciting, 380. Who wouldn't say, whoa, man, 380 people getting freedom. No, whoa, 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 there's more. I get excited about the 172 people who make it possible to reach the 380 people who gave their whole weekend and who gave seven or eight weeks of their life to disciple these people through the freedom process because everybody wants to reach the 380, but if you don't have the 172 who are willing to minister to the 380, all you have is a hallucination. You don't have a vision. Because a vision that is executable requires leaders. Jesus said it this way, don't wait three or four months and then the harvest. Quit praying about the harvest. The harvest is plentiful, it's the laborers. The laborers are few. I came in here, there was people in the balconies, they were wearing white. I thought there were angels in the room. I thought, did we invite angels? I guess we want those too. It was a group of people who came here all weekend to pray for the participants. Some of you are like, well, I don't have a lot of gifts. Come pray. Like, I don't know what to pray. We'll give you a few verses. Just say it over and over and over. <laughs> so I'm talking about a practical thing. I can go, you can go every week to Milestone Life blog where we tell you stories of how this vision is impacting real everyday people. This week, I'm thinking, I wanna make it real. I just go to our Milestone Life blog and the story there is the story of a lady named Belinda. She moved here from Australia, her and her husband and her family. They'd been a part of a church for 14 years in Australia. He got transferred. They moved here. And they start looking around for a church. By the way, we don't believe Milestone's the only church. There's great churches. If the vision God's given you doesn't align with where Milestone is, go find a church that aligns with how God, how you see it and how you ex but you need to get plugged in somewhere and start aligning Jesus' values with how you live every day. She starts searching around and 
We believe God sets you as members of the body and her and her husband and they're a little frustrated and somebody from our church dropped off a welcome basket at their house. Because we believe lost people need to be reached. We take people a welcome basket It's not full of a bunch of junk. You know, how don't you hate church people sometimes? Here's a bunch of leftover junk we didn't want. We want to give it to you. It's got good stuff in it. Come on now. And that thing sat on the counter until a little while, till they, they, they said, well, let's go try that. When they came here, her husband, after all, they walked in, sat down, looked at her, hasn't heard the pastor preach, hasn't heard the worship leader lead song, hasn't heard any of that stuff. It's not about the professional Christians. They saw in the atmosphere, the friendliness, the warmth, the ownership that comes from shared vision. They felt it. That's what you may have felt when you came here. And he looked at his wife and said, I think we found our home. Because why? They, they sense it. You sense it when you're around it. The husband was water baptized. The son was water baptized. And now she found a small group of people that she's doing life with and serves at Elevate. That's a picture of what I'm talking about. I want to pray with you right now. Bow your heads with me. Father, I pray for all of us right now, every person within the sound of my voice. Lord, would you help us so hard with all the competing things around our world to stay biblically centered to your priorities. Help us today, Lord. We're not under condemnation, but we do want to live convicted. Pray for if there's any person needs to say yes to, to Jesus, you just would. Just say, Jesus, you can have my life. He'll transform what you say is important. Jesus, come into my life. You can pray it. Become my Lord and Savior. I believe you died for me, rose from the dead. He'll come in and change you. But for all of us, Lord, help us, Lord, to, to prioritize your vision, to think about the who's around our lives and help us to be able to answer every day why we do what we do. In Jesus' name, amen.